Aloha and welcome to Tuning Up with Iggy and Dave. I am Dave. Once again, we are without Iggy, but this is a two-part episode. And I promise you will get to see the one and only Iggy Chang if you tune in to our other Tuning Up episode this week, where he will be joined by our soloist for our upcoming Masterworks performance, Sterling Elliott. But today, I have the absolute joy and pleasure of welcoming a good friend, a phenomenal conductor, uh, and I believe a conductor doing his U.S. debut with the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra, none other than Dane Lamb. Dane, welcome. Thanks, Dave. It's great to chat to you across the ocean. We're excited for you to join us here in Hawaii. Now, you're joining us on the Zoom today from Australia. You're in which part? I'm in Brisbane, Brisbane, Australia. So I'm talking to you in the morning from a beautiful Brisbane at summer's day. It's lovely and sunny outside. It's a bit different to last week where there was flash flooding, but uh, everything has, has, is okay now. So you, you can tell us the future because it's tomorrow there, right? Oh, that's right. That's right. It's Tuesday morning here. Absolutely. And is this where you make your home? Is your home in Brisbane? It is now, actually. Uh, it, it, I was born and bred in Brisbane and then went overseas to study, firstly at, at Juilliard, which is where we first worked together. And then... Um, I um, made my base in the UK, was happy there, had an orchestra in China, still have an orchestra in China. And uh, during the pandemic, my wife and I were living in London and with gradually all the concerts and the operas were dropping out of the diary. And we thought, oh, what are we gonna do? I mean, it was quite a nice existence walking around in the spring in London. That was during the first lockdown. It was quite pleasant in London at that time, notwithstanding all the uncertainty and the hardship that arose from, from the coronavirus. And then I was talking to my Australian agent one day and he said, mate, come back to Australia, everything's good. And so we flew back to Brisbane in um, mid 2020, not knowing what to expect, but it's been fantastic. And the musical community has really embraced us and, and it's just an, a wonderful place to call home. Wonderful. I'm so happy to hear that. And I'm sure friends and family are glad that you're back uh, on the continent and uh, enjoying time with them. So, so what, what's it been like during the pandemic? I, because Australia has been a little different than other places. Um, not so much different than Hawaii, actually, I would say. But um, I think one of the difference was your performing arts organizations were incredibly active, it seemed, uh, although there were some ups and downs. So were there a lot of performances? What was that first time like back on the podium in Australia? Yeah, there were a, there were a lot of performances that were able to take place. So I suppose I, I had the great honor to conduct the very first orchestral performance after everything had happened, which was... I think it was must have been late August 2020 with the Adelaide Symphony Orchestra, and 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 subsequent to that, I, I did the first performances with with Queensland and also Opera Queensland, uh, and there was such joy on all the players' faces. It's something that you you, you don't always experience in the orchestral world, but people had been. I mean, mercifully in Australia, they were only out from, from you know, March to, to August or September. So it wasn't as long a break as some of our colleagues around the world faced. But it was still significant and there was all the uncertainty around it. And Australia handled the pandemic in quite um, a hardline way. Australia shut the borders to, well, even Australians, it was quite hard. I had to do two weeks hotel quarantine when I got back and there were caps on the number of passengers allowed into Australia. Uh, it was very difficult and very controversial, but what it meant was that cases of, of COVID were very low, especially in my home state of Queensland and, and South Australia where Adelaide is, where Perth, Western Australia. Things continued, apart from a few snap three, four day lockdowns, things continued pretty much Normally, the same can't be said for somewhere like Melbourne or Sydney, which who both endured long lockdowns. 
but uh, my wife and I are very fortunate to be making music in Australia. Oh, that's wonderful. With all these lockdowns, have you been able to visit your orchestra in China? Oh, my goodness. Well, there's a story with that. I, ha I haven't seen them for two years and I really wanted to get back. But it, uh, China is even more hard line than Australia when it comes to quarantine. So it was going to be 28 days of, of some kind of quarantine between hotel, home, community monitoring. So December, January, fairly quiet months in, in Australia, in the music season in Australia, because our seasons are back to front compared to the norm, Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so I thought, okay, I'm going to go back to Xi'an, do a bunch of concerts. Um, just, just for viewers, it's the Xi'an Symphony Orchestra. This is my orchestra in China. Uh, Xi'an is famous because it's the home of the Terracotta Warriors, and it was the very first capital of China. And I went back to Xi'an, did my two weeks quarantine in a hotel in Shanghai, then I got to Xi'an and did my home quarantine. And as that was happening in December, Xi'an went into lockdown around me. And you might have seen on the news that that was the city of 13 million people that locked down in December. So I was stuck there. The concerts were canceled and it didn't look like, like I could get out. They weren't letting me out of the country. Uh, so I had to call everybody I knew and somehow after 31 days in quarantine, I managed to get out. So I spent the whole month of December in quarantine and there were no concerts in the end. And sadly, it means I, I wasn't able to reconnect with my orchestra, but I really tried. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. What a what an experience, uh, I'm sure. And I guess that the follow up question is what hobbies emerged from 31 days in quarantine, uh, especially with the experiences that you had? Yeah, well, I got very good at meditation and yoga, which is something that I probably should do more of in everyday life. <laughs> I, I can I tell you I really appreciated the food blog uh, that you were doing uh, during that time yes. the updates on uh, what was being provided so the the food was one of the best things about the hotel quarantine actually I've got to say it's much better than Australian hotel quarantine food well <laughs> if you had a choice if you had a choice yeah <laughs> yeah if I had it. so when's the next time you'll see that orchestra then in China it's a good question. It's a good question. We're trying to work out how it's going to be possible. It all depends really on China's quarantine policy, uh, because at the moment, China is still pursuing an absolute COVID zero policy. And after the experience in December, I, I, I'm wary to go while there's any kind of quarantine requirement. Un understandable, I would say. Yeah. Well, we're we're lucky. Uh, I feel very grateful that we get to have you here at the, in one of your neighbor islands uh, here in Hawaii. Um, we've talked uh, a lot about the Pacific and the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra being uh, a Pacific-centric orchestra, one that is reflective of this community, uh, one that looks to the rest of the Pacific uh, for inspiration and for programming ideas. And uh, you're on the on the other edge uh, of the Pacific uh, from us, if you will. And uh, excited that we have a composer also from Australia featured on this program. Um, so let's let's dig into the program, uh, if we yes. may. Uh, so. We have a, a work by Mahler. Uh, we have uh, a wonderful new piece by Maria Grenfell called Clockwork. Uh, not that new of a piece, actually, 1991, I believe it is, which- um, That's right. Yeah, uh, it, it, makes us, it makes it almost old enough, uh, well, it definitely can vote at this point. So, <laughs> um, and then we have two pieces with our cello soloist, Sterling Elliott, uh, one by Tchaikovsky and one by probably a lesser known composer, if you're not a cellist, David Popper. Um, if you are a cellist, of course, you know the Popper Etudes, um, which uh, haunts all cellists, I believe. And then the program will close with uh, the Brahms Symphony, number two in D major. I'm really excited to have a symphony on the program. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, outside of uh, a Haydn symphony on the last performance, our masterworks indoors this year have not featured a lot of traditional symphonies. Uh, so really excited to have this on the program. What is this the first time you've conducted the Brahms Symphony? 
It is not the first time I've conducted the Brahms Symphony. It's one of my favorites. I love the Brahms symphonies. They're four almost perfect masterpieces and they're all very different. And I, I first discovered Brahms with some of my teachers through, well, among others, Kurt Mazur, who, who conducted this, this work with the Gewandhaus Orchestra, Brahms' orchestra in Leipzig many times. And so over the years, I've, I've, I've been able to assist and then conduct it with orchestras in a lot of different continents. And it's been able to, to sort of grow with me. And I think there's such a deep yearning and lyricism and humanity, humor, little games that Brahms plays that, that communicates to audiences everywhere. Let me get the numbers straight on this. Um, Brahms, I believe, spent 14 years composing the first symphony, roughly 1855 to 1876, and then only four months to complete his second. Do you have any, what's, what's behind Brahms in this? Was, he, was this in his mind the entire time? I, I think that it seems to me that Brahms had the great weight of the expectation of the entire musical world as it was back then. He was, he was the next great hope for the symphony, this form that, that had been expounded by Mozart and Haydn and then Beethoven. And he had Beethoven's Ninth, the great choral Ode to Joy symphony, hanging over his head. And so he took a very, very long time to write his first symphony. And in fact, the first piano concerto, which, which he wrote before the first symphony, was going to be a symphony and then he scrapped it. it, just wasn't good enough. And so the first symphony is a very epic affair, whereas the second symphony, he could just relax. He was sitting by the lake in his summer house and, and, and this, this, this gorgeous symphony emerged out of it. And it's often called this his sunny symphony and it is sunny and it's melodious, it's beautiful. You'll walk out of the hall humming it, but there, there are also shadows, there's also some darkness present, like in life. And after only 30 seconds of music, really, you'll hear the timpani, the low timpani, and these trombones that, that are unusual addition to, to classical and romantic symphonies a lot of times. I mean, Mozart used, used trombones to, to show the supernatural, like in Don Giovanni or the magic flute or Beethoven reserved them for very special moments in his symphonies. And, and here is Brahms introducing this dark sound combined with the timpanis very early on. So it's this sort of dichotomy between lightness and darkness, but it, it does finish very bright. I'm sure people will love it. It will be a, a wonderful final note of this weekend's performances uh, with the Brahms Symphony. Um, let's go to the, the top of the program, though. We're going to open, you are going to open, not where you're going to open, uh, with uh, Mahler's Blue Me. And uh, I just would like to read a little quote, a little excerpt from uh, the program notes that are written for the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra by our dear friend, wonderful composer uh, and um personality, Michael Thomas Fumai, because I think this puts this piece in a really unique perspective. So this is on Gustav Mahler's Blooming. Uh, revisionism is an unwelcome practice for the purist, but creates must, creatives must work out the kink sometimes after the public release of their art. So imagine a 13 episode television series subsequently rebroadcasted with only 12, the second episode removed, never seen again for seven decades. Enter intrigue and curiosity and the story of Mahler's Blooming, the original second movement of his symphony number one. Mind you of a television show? It does actually, it does. I wish the producers of Game of Thrones had exercised the same discernment that Mahler did by excising the entire last season. I'm sure Game of Thrones fans will agree. Well, maybe not. We can, we can, we can chat about it after the concert, maybe. Seven decades later, we, we perhaps get uh, the final season uh, and maybe it'll be seen in a different light. Um. Yeah, well, maybe <laughs> they would just rethink it a bit more and, and 
do justice to the opening of the story. Yeah, so we've got this Mahler work that um, is a standalone movement of uh, formerly of a symphony. So talk us through this. Yeah, Mahler went sort of similarly to Brahms. He went through some significant mm, birthing pains for his first symphony. And it's also interesting to note that Brahms and Mahler would have known each other. Brahms was older, but they were both in Vienna. They were both writing music. Brahms was seen as the traditional, the, the academic, and Mahler was this radical. And he wrote this, this sprawling symphony, which originally had five movements, which was fairly unusual. Symphonies often only had four movements traditionally. And he gave it a program. He gave it a story. Um, Call, he called it the Titan Symphony originally. And, and so this, the second movement, this Blumina, was, was the, the second movement. And it, it, it's for a much smaller orchestra than the rest of the symphony. And he originally wrote it for, for this, this story about a, a trumpeter. It's interesting because this, this gorgeous serenade um, really, really features the trumpet and that's something that 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 audiences can look out for this this gorgeous silvery trumpet solo and it, it's very it's it's imbued with emotion some people say that that Brahms uh, that sorry Mahler wrote this because he was in love with a soprano and so he wrote this this movement as a kind of love song to her and I should understand that because I'm married to a soprano Mahler was one of the greatest conductors of his age. He liked sopranos. I like sopranos and I'm a conductor. So it, it, it all sort of fits in. But there are, there are hallmarks of the Mahlerian style, the harmonies, the, the swooning uh, glissando portamento strings sliding up to these high notes, but all the way over it. There's, there's this trumpet solo. And, and Mahler also uses really interesting pairs of, of melodic instruments. If, if you listen out, you'll hear in the middle section, him combining this, this, this sort of question and answer melodic interplay between the oboe, which often has melodies, and the double basses. And, 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 and these melodies sort of seem incongruous, but go together. Well, the same thing, there's very high cello melodies, in, in you know, quite a tricky string key, G flat major, and, and that duet is with, with the flutes. So it's being a conductor, Mahler really understood how to exploit the very most beautiful and, and interesting colors out of the orchestra. Well, what an exciting way to open our Hungarian Rhapsodies program. Touch a little bit on the, the Popper and the Tchaikovsky. Yeah, so, so the Popper, Popper was, was also mates with Brahms. It's funny, it's, it was a very small musical world in Vienna at that time. And Popper uh, was a Moravian composer, but mostly a cellist. And, and all our cellist friends will understand that, that he wrote some of the best virtuosic music for the cello. And so this Hungarian Rhapsody is full of all this Hungarian folk music fire. It's very, uh, improvisatory in quality and and it um, it exemplifies the very best the very most exciting and flamboyant music to come out of the cello it's it's not long it's fun it's absolutely virtuosic and I'm sure Sterling Elliott will play it brilliantly and as a contrast to that the Tchaikovsky Andante Cantabile is all about melody. And I would say that, that Tchaikovsky was an inheritor of, of Brahms's great gift for melody. Brahms was a great melodist, melodist as you'll see. You know, you think of Brahms's lullaby, which, which coincidentally, uh, the second episode in the first movement of the symphony, if you listen to the violas and cellos, pretty much the same. It's the same sort of melodic contour, shape, as, as Brahms's lullaby. So Tchaikovsky inherited this great melodic gift from this giant Brahms and, and 
and really this arrangement for, for cello and orchestra exploits the melodic possibilities of this singing human voiced cello. Oh, can't wait. Can't wait. And there's one more piece on the program that we have yet to talk about, uh, The Clockwork by Maria Grenfell. And um, I, in reading about her and reading about uh, this piece, I was particularly interested to see that her inspiration uh, behind this was two wonderful pillars of, of repertoire. Uh, Bartok's Music for Strings, Percussion and Celeste and the Bach Brandenburg Concertos. Um, and I remember when we first were talking about this program, you had sent, you had suggested this. I remember listening to that for the first time and was just enraptured by the sounds that she created with the orchestra. So tell us a little bit about this piece. Yeah, in a way, this, this, this ties, Maria's work ties the whole program together. Um, she wrote it when she was still a student, a postgraduate student. And she was fascinated by Bartok's music for strings, percussion, and, and, and celeste, mostly because of how Bartok used the different entries of this, this many voice, this, this fugue. Each entry would, would, would raise the stakes harmonically. And so Maria wanted to experiment with that herself. So if you're looking at a piano, she starts the first entry of this, this, this dynamic, diabolical little melody on a C. And then the next entry goes one step down, one whole step down on a B flat. And then the next entry goes one step above the C to a D. And the next entry is one step below the B flat to an A. And so it sort of fans out like this until it comes back to the C again. And Bartok, finally was a student of Hans Kursler, who was a very close contemporary of Brahms and of Popper. So there's that link there. But also, Maria loved the Brandenburg concertos of Bach, where the solo strings, the string principles would act as soloists in these Brandenburg concerti, accompanied then by the full body of strings. And there's a gorgeously jaunty little section in the middle of, of clockwork that, that, that harks back to, to Bach and his Brandenburg concertos. And of course, Brahms played a big role in reviving music of the past because at, at that time, composers would write something and then it'd be gone. Mozart wrote his operas and then they weren't played again for, for decades, for until the next century, actually. And so, Brahms really looked up to Bach and helped to revive his music. And so Maria Grenfell's clockwork, apart from being compatriot, it ties the whole program really together nicely with a beautiful bow. Oh, wonderful. Well, I, if you're not sold on coming to the performances this weekend at the Hawaii Theater, um, I, I hope this uh, convinced you because it's a tremendous program. Um, I so look forward to, to having Dane on the podium uh, with the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra and uh, to be able to welcome you to Hawaii. And uh, your, is it your US debut? Is this your... It is my US debut. I, I, I did my master's in New York and I haven't really conducted in, in, in America since then. So this will be my US debut. I'm really, really looking forward to it. And as a beach tragic from way back, I can't wait to experience Hawaii's beaches. They, they are uh, one of a kind. Uh, we look forward to showing them off to you here and uh, allowing this community to, to meet you and to get to experience your conducting. Um, just really appreciate your time, Dane, before you make the big journey uh, with a stopover in LA before you uh, come to Hawaii here. It's a long day of travel, I know, but uh, really grateful uh, that you're coming to conduct the orchestra. And I just wanna thank our entire community Thank you for your support. Thanks for tuning in for this. Make sure you watch uh, Iggy's episode with Sterling Elliott, and we'll have to return to one of these formal tuning ups uh, in the near future here. But uh, just wanted to say thanks for the support. If you want tickets for this weekend's performance, they start at $18. They're available at myhso.org. And Dane, aloha. Great to see you. And we'll aloha. see you here in Hawaii very, very soon. All right. Thanks, have a wonderful Dave. night. Hey, everybody.